you know, what do I want to do? I want to do something that's impactful. And then around that time, I heard a podcast about a company that trains you to convert single family homes into assisted living facilities. I was like, well, look, I think I can do that. And I'm in Dallas. That seems to be a good market for it. It's no secret that real estate is one of the best investment vehicles out there. But how can we determine which strategies will best align with our financial ambitions? Well, you've come to the right spot. Whether you're an active real estate entrepreneur, a passive investor, or looking to get into real estate investing, our goal is to provide investors with the insights and strategies for building our portfolios all while protecting our capital. I'm Daniel Nichols, and this is the Two Smart Assets Real Estate Investing Podcast. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Daniel Nichols, accompanied by our guest for the week, Low Hornbuckle. And today we are the two smart assets. For those not yet familiar with Low, he is the CEO of Sage Oak Assisted Living and Memory Care and is co-founder of Goodhorn Capital, a real estate investment firm that helps investors achieve financial freedom and create long-term value by owning and repositioning real estate. Low is also passionate about improving the living experience of residents in assisted living facilities by providing quality care and leveraging the advantages of scale. Low, my man, it's great to see you. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me uh, all the way out from Denver. That's right, man. Pumped to talk to you. Been pumped to talk to you for a while now. Uh, before we dive into the conversation, Marina, we're going to talk about assisted living, all that stuff. Uh, tell us more about your background, your story, and how you got into real estate. Yeah, um, so I started, you know, my business background was I was a car dealer. So I, I sold okay. cars for 12 years, but really only about a year and a half, I was a car salesman and I got in the finance side of things. And that was a really uh, good experience to kind of move into things because uh, two, two reasons. Number one is I dealt with banks and underwriting and, you know, learned concepts like loan to value and term and, you know, kind of interest rate concepts. But but also two, you, um, and when you're in finance, um, you talk to the same lenders over and over and over again. So it's a bit like being a mortgage broker. And so there's a really strong relationship sales component to it. And so I kind of found out quickly that, um, I didn't like transactional sales, right? If I sell someone a car, maybe they come back in three to five years, they refer somebody to me, but I was talking to the same 30 or 40 bank banks, you know, every week, sometimes multiple times a day. And so, you know, you have to really maintain that relationship, right? You, you can, you can build a relationship over years and then you can ruin it. And just, just one deal that, right. you, you know, say something wrong or you misrepresent yourself in some way. And uh, so that was really an awesome launching pad. And like anybody else, when you sell cars, you know, I went from selling warranties on Honda to being in dementia care. So it was very natural (laughs) progression. No, nothing unusual about that at all. Right. Everyone goes straight from the Honda dealership to dementia care. Yeah, no. No twists and curves along that road. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's that's funny, man. So, so you know, you went from there, and then somewhere along the path, you found you found real estate, right? So, was you know going into assisted living the first thing there, or what did that look like for you? No, so I uh, started. I did my first, uh, you know, real estate investment transaction. I was always interested, you know, and, and of course, uh, you know, when I was in, you know, I started working in two thousand one, really, and and you know, and back in like. 03, 2007, that was like the height of all the real estate shows. And right. you know, everybody was doing, you know, all those, all those people were coming famous. So I just kept constantly wanting to get involved in real estate. Unfortunately, I lived in Shreveport, Louisiana, which is like uh, one of the worst economies like on earth. And so <laughs> if not, you know, it's just such a bad economy. So like, you know, everyone says, you know, you, you don't have to do this in your own backyard, but I think everyone kind of starts in their own backyard because they don't sure. you know, they kind of have to. Um, so I did my first deal in 2000 seven to 2008. And so it was a flip. And then of course, 2008 happened and I didn't sell it. So I ended up having to be creative and and lease it out and figure some things out. And so we kind of got burned on our first deal, but it ended up becoming a winner. It was just a slow bleeder for like four or five years. And then we ended up selling it for a nice profit. But, um, and then uh, 2010, I started to notice like, Hey, the market's turning and there was a lot of like distressed assets. And I was able to buy a lot of things that I thought were like 50 cents on the dollar. Um, And so I was doing a lot of, um, I was doing a lot of like rehab to rent. I didn't know what it was called back then, but we just thought like, hey, if you rehab something to rent it out, um, we can have a good product. And so I really didn't like flipping much. I really enjoyed, you know, the rental side of things. So while I was running the car dealership, I was I was kind of like the leasing manager. And then I had a partner that um, that was kind of like on the construction management side because um, we quickly figured out I was I was bad at construction management. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny how you figure out the things you're actually bad at, right? Before you figure out the things you're good at. At least that's how it's been in my experience. But uh, sure. yeah, um, love to hear that, man. So, so you know, you're doing those things. You've done a couple of things with real estate, and I know you've actually done more than that. So, where did where did the assisted living come into play? Where where was the spark for that, and how did you get started there? 
Yeah, I think it was a kind of a convergence of a few things. So, um, you know, when I when I left the car dealership, I, I really just really didn't want to leave the car dealership. I loved where I worked, but and I, I had really, you know, I ended up partnering with the owner later. But um, I just didn't want to live in Shreveport anymore. And, you know, I'd, I'd been going to Dallas consistently. So I was like, all right, I'm going to relocate to Dallas. And I kind of didn't know what I was going to do. But in the interim, I, I took a job um, managing an apartment complex. I felt like, you know, I could have the skills to do that. And so I was running about a 400 unit apartment complex. Really wasn't enjoying it, and um, around that time, my dad, my dad got sick, and he had a really bad experience, and you know that kind of, you know, I just, I didn't know what I was going to do, and I just got done doing some traveling, and so you're kind of this place, I guess, my quarter life crisis or midlife crisis. I'm not going to live very long, who knows? But um, I, you know, just started like, okay, you know, what do I want to do? I want to do something that's impactful. Then around that time, I heard a podcast about a company that trains you to convert single family homes into assisted living facilities. I was like, well, look, I think I can do that. And I'm in Dallas. That seems to be a good market for it. So I just kind of studied the Dallas market, kind of found out that there weren't a lot of care homes, um, you know, like Dallas and Phoenix are, they're relatively similar size cities. Sure. And, and so there's like maybe like 20 X or even maybe even a hundred X of the care homes in Phoenix as there are in Dallas. Uh-huh. And so I thought there might be a supply and demand imbalance in Dallas for the certain type of smaller homes. And so we actually worked to coin the term boutique assisted living and memory care. We actually have a, a patent uh, on that or trademark rather. Wow. Um, it's hard to enforce, but um, we're <laughs> one day, one day. But anyway, so we kind of came up with the term boutique assisted living because a lot of people were using residential assisted living, but I felt like it was an um, inadequate term um, because it's really about smaller versus big, right? It doesn't matter if you're on commercial, right? So residential is kind of a misleading term. Mm. And so you just want these small uh, intimate facilities. And a lot of times um, purpose-built stuff on commercial land is actually superior in some ways um, to that. So when my dad got sick and I heard the podcast, I didn't connect the dots. I didn't really like, it wasn't linear, uh, but I just was like, okay. And so uh, I found somebody that was doing it locally and went toward their homes. And, you know, I, I don't even know that when I got in, when I started thinking, about, I don't think I like the elderly. Like I really don't think that I did. And so I was very nervous and very intimidated. And then like I met everybody, I'm like, okay, this is really cool. And then as soon as I started doing that, all the stuff with my dad kind of started coming back. And so those emotions started coming back and um, I, I got fortunate and, and I started working on a project um, in that space after getting a little bit of training. And then, and then I started another project. And, and after a week I surveyed the residents because I bought a house with some residents and I sheepishly asked them, you know, I bought it from this company. They've been in business for eight years. And I'm like, Hey, how are we doing? They're like, you're so much better. And I'm like, really? really? And so I was just kind of surprised. So I, I mean, you know, you didn't know what you could do it or not. And, and then I just sort of was just at, sort of natural at it. And, you know, ultimately, um, you know, my job, uh, right, frankly, is I just I have you know, about a hundred employees or so and spread out throughout the various regions that we're in. And, you know, me and me and the corporate team, we just manage the emotional energy of, 20 or 30 people. And we hope that they manage the emotional energy of the other 70 people. So it really is just a, you know, it's a leadership business. It's a human resource business. And, um, you know, we've, we've obviously done well on the design side of things and, and we just bring some interesting concepts and I'm just a, uh, we kind of bring a different approach to certain things. We, we really believe in strengths-based leadership versus, you know, you know, trying to work on your weaknesses and, um, we've brought a few different operational concepts that I think are a bit unique and, and we've managed to take something that was probably, I mean, to be honest with you, I honestly, I was married at the time and like, no one really thought I had a business partner that supported me, but he didn't think it was a good idea. Mm. He's just like, I bet on the jockey. You believe in this, you're yeah. the jockey, you know, run the race. And, um, so probably nobody thought this was a good idea. I mean, really no one did except me. And I just thought it was a good idea. And then I just kind of fell in love with it. And I just got very lucky that I, I found my passion and, got an opportunity to kind of help help people and and so now it's kind of become this game where it's like all right what can this like you know college dropout hick accomplish inside this relatively complex you know um you know complicated you know heavy licensure high barrier for entry business and so it's been it's been a really fun journey and obviously covid was challenging and hard so it's been a journey but we've you know we've taken some lumps and bruises along the way but you know i think we've kept a lot of people safe and we um have done a lot of really amazing work in in, uh, in Texas and Louisiana. Yeah, well, I mean, I really like that story, and I love that's kind of like a passion play, right? Like uh, it's one of those things that's really, you know, you you taking the emotional part of it and put your business acumen together, right, and been able to create something really special. And the one thing I kind of want to hit on is you mentioned that you know this from 
from a, a business perspective and operations perspective, this is very intensive business, right? This is not just a lot of our listeners are, you know, passive investors, whether it's multifamily or self storage, right? So sure. uh, those are those are a business of themselves, right? But from from a, a service side, or maybe like an operational side, they're typically pretty straightforward, right? Uh, but when it comes to assisted living, memory care, they're, it's, it's much more intensive. So can you give us an idea of kind of, you know, what it takes to operate an assisted living facility uh, and how you're be able, able to be so effective with that process and kind of, you know, separate yourself from, from the rest? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, I think really what it takes is you're going to have to be able to manage a large team, right? So you have to, you got to have key people. Um, and so like, as a good rule of thumb, you know, for every, every bed you have, you may have, you know, depending on how you staff things, you're going to have anywhere from like half an employee to like a full employee, right? Mm -hmm. So a thousand bed assisted living portfolio means you have anywhere from 500 to a thousand employees, depending wow. on how you staff. I'm, I'm on the heavy staffing side. So I would likely have like, you know, 800 to a thousand um, employees. And so if you have a thousand apartments, you might have 40 employees, maybe, right. if that. And a lot of times you're doing out, uh, third party management. Um, I, I think probably the key for us has really been, and I, I hate to use the term vertical integration because it's really overused, but like truthfully, what we found is, you know, because we, we're, we're, we're developers now and um, we develop a signature product, uh, our campus design, where we design a campus of residential assisted living facilities or boutique assisted living and memory care facilities all on one campus. And um, uh, and we were really fortunate last year to win a, 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 an award in our industry, Senior Housing News, for design for standalone memory care. And uh, it was really cool, you know, because uh, it was our first ground up design. And, you know, it started on a napkin. You know, the architect <laughs> obviously designed it. But, you know, I'm sitting in a restaurant drawing it up and like, wow. well, maybe we should put the kitchen here. And I'm like, yeah, but you get the idea. So we designed this really cool, this really cool H format. But I think one of the things that's really made us successful is, is that in a traditional development deal, there's the developer, there's the builder, there's the investors, there's the operator, there's the architect, and there's all these different people that have all these different um, opinions and perspectives and ways of doing things. And we just try to occupy as many seats at the table as we could so that um, I designed the product like an operator, meaning that there wasn't a developer, there wasn't a builder saying, what if we cut this out and then we do this? And then you end up you know, kind of doling the operational efficiency of, of what you're hoping to do. So, you know, we raise our own capital. So we have an investor group that kind of understands what we want to do. Our business plans are usually 10 year holds. We've done a couple of opportunity, opportunity zone deals. In fact, uh, you know, which honestly I haven't met very many people that have, I think that was kind of a dud, right. but we've done some opportunity zone deals. So we're doing these longer holds. So our capital's patient. Um, a lot of our, our, our investors have a personal reason for investing in assisted living or memory care. Maybe their, their loved one is in the is in is in an assisted living facility. They lost someone to dementia, and so for them, you know, I've even had investors say to us, you know, if I do an oil well and it's dry, I'm mad. But you know, if you lose my money trying to you know improve the quality of life of these people, then like, hey, we went down swinging and we did what we could. So um, I think just occupying the sort of the being on the design side, being on the operation side. You know, being on the capital raising side, um, and, and at one time we had in-house builders, um, but we, we don't anymore. We had a tragedy, and someone passed away. But um, you know, so we we do as much as we can in-house, and so that allows us to have a lot of quality control over the process. And we ultimately always end up with a product that's designed by an operator, and that's really important in assisted living. Whereas you know, a lot of times maybe in the apartment business or the self storage business, if you hire an operator. They kind of come in at the end and you're like, here's the thing to operate, right? And that's not really the way you want to do it. You really want the operator to shape the product because ultimately mm -hmm. they're going to be responsible for for selling it. And it's got to be friendly for the staff and friendly for the residents and families need to be able to visit with ease. And so really designing with an operator's heart. So I think really probably the key was is that everybody that I know that wants to get an assisted living memory care, they all want to avoid the operations. But the truth is <laughs> that's where everything important happens. And so I was talking to a friend and um, he he kind of was a multifamily guy and he kind of ventured off into senior housing. He might say that he got his teeth kicked in. He might say that it went okay, but it didn't go, it wasn't quite as easy as multifamily. And he just told me, he was like, there's all this money that wants to come into assisted living, but nobody wants to operate. And so I was like, ding, like, what if I just did the thing that nobody wants to do? You know, so I just trained myself how to be an assisted living and memory care operator. And so that really was, I think that really is the key is that we, we do the work and we're not, we're not outsourcing like, Hey, like take care of our grandma, please do a good job. Like we're not asking someone else to do that for us. We're actually taking on the responsibility of doing that. 
Um, and to this day, um, probably to my detriment, right? We don't want to grow fast, but you know, to, to you know, to to my detriment, I still hand pick nearly every high level employee, right? Nearly wow. every every manager, every nurse I probably interviewed at some point. There's there may not have been a single manager that's been hired that didn't interview with me at some point. And so I'm kind of the, you know, I'm the CEO, but I'm really the chief recruitment officer. And so my job is really to make sure that we find the right who, the right people. Right. And then they work on the how, they work on the what. Um, and so we really focus hard on, you know, managing people's energy, getting the right people with the right why, the right desire, the right heart, the right system fit. Because we ask a lot of our people and, and we try to say, look, say joke, represents a set of curbs in the road, right? And then you can stay stay inside these curbs, but if you want to go in reverse, you can, like if you want to do it your own way. So we try to give our our, our site supervisors, our executive directors, our team, they, we give them leeway to do things the way they want to do them inside the, the realm of what's a cultural fit, is it legal, is it ethical? And, and so, um, you know, we're not that company that thinks that, oh, if you hand someone a thousand page policy and procedure binder, they'll just do everything in it, right? Because that, that's not really what how it works, right? You have to manage people. And, and a lot of people, in my opinion, in real estate, that's kind of a weakness. Um, you know, there, there are obviously a lot of great real estate investors, but there's a lot of people that are really successful in real estate. They're not leaders. They're not salespeople. You know, they're just, you know, they're managing buildings, not people. And so um, I just had to kind of become somebody that was a leader. And um, so that that was been a big, big kind of part of the journey. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and as, as a real estate investor myself, right, you know, actually on a lot of real estate investing podcasts, we hear about assisted living, residential assisted living, right? It's it's very popular over the last few years. We hear more and more about it. And, you know, you know, when I go invest in, say, a multifamily property or a single family property or a self-storage facility, right, that's that's pretty much pure real estate play, right? But when it comes to uh, res, uh, assisted living, kind of the stuff you're doing right now, yeah, there's a real estate component, right? But it's it's basically you're you're investing in if you're an investor you're investing in a business right you're investing in sure. um uh, on the service side right because it's so intensive is that is that does that sound about right yeah so i mean you know if uh if apartments are maybe 80% real estate 20% business then maybe flip the order and it's 80% business mm -hmm. 20% you know real estate and i think storage might be like 90 10 real estate 10% yeah. business because you can automate a lot of that yeah i mean <laughs> i have a friend I, he kind of makes this joke you know about aviation but it's, it's really true for a lot of people in assisted living too you know how do you how do you make a million dollars in assisted living start with 10 million so you know that's <laughs> that's what happens to a lot of people so you know i think unfortunately um what's kind of happened and it's been good and bad right we um there's been some people out in the marketplace and they're kind of selling this as like hey this is a real estate play and right. so there's a lot of people that from the real estate world that have come in and so right now you kind of have these two different groups that, that are that are coming into the business and it's really fascinating. So you have the healthcare side. So you have these nurses and these doctors that come in and they like they think if it's a healthcare play and then you have these real estate people that come and think it's a real estate play and like they're both wrong because it's a yeah. business and it's a service it's a human resources business. And so like there's a, like some of the worst losses I've ever seen in assisted living have been doctors because they oh. think that it's a healthcare play and it's not. And you know like you got to be good at marketing and like you know if you're a doctor this is not a not a knock on doctors. Most doctors don't actually collect money from their patients. Mm -hmm. They collect money from other payment sources. It's a little different when you're having to go find somebody that can stroke a six thousand dollar, seven thousand dollar, eight thousand dollar, ten thousand dollar check every month for care. And then when they're doing that, it comes with expectations and responsibilities right. and a lot of stuff. Right? Um, it's a little hard to get upset when like. Medicare is paying someone to do something for you. You're just kind of like, yeah, do better because you're not, you don't really feel the impact. But when you're writing the check and someone lets you down, you're going to voice your opinion. You're going to do that. And so it's absolutely a service business, uh, customer focused service business. And then more than anything, it's a human resources business, right? Where you have to have, you know, the ability to, you know, manage payrolls and, and deal with everything associated with that. And, and, you know, people need loans between pay or payday and, and then you got to, you got to hire people in a staffing shortage, right? We have far too few healthcare workers in America. Um, and so there, there's just a lot that happens. So I think a lot of people have the wrong idea and, and, and a lot of people kind of approach this like the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. And that really can't be further, further from the truth. It's really more like find the staff that right. are good and then you can get residents. And so it's really, it's more an HR play in my opinion than it is a, um, a real estate play or anything else. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned, you know, there's a couple of different parties kind of trying to come together, trying to do this, right? And you've seen a lot of a big losses kind of come from that, right? So, you know, I think it was, it, you still see it today, but like, let's just take, for example, self-storage, right? You see, um, it's a really fragmented market, right? You see a lot sure. of mom and pop owners, little small, mid-size, and you got these big operators, right? It, what is it like with assisted living providers? Is it the same type of thing? Or is it just like a whole bunch of you oh, know, yeah. smaller, middle, and then large? What does that look like? Yeah, no, I think our company... Yeah, I think our company's probably in what I would describe as a danger zone. Being mm. being a certain size, is, we're in a process of scaling. So we have a we kind of a goal to kind of get out of that. But what kind of happens is when you're kind of small, you have a, you know maybe three or four facilities, thirty or forty beds. You know, you can kind of run it like a mom and pop. And and, and what we see a lot of is some of the times the first facility you open is your best facility because you're there forty hours a week and you're the manager and no one's going to run it like you do. And then you kind of get to a certain place where you got three or four locations. I mean, different cities, and you kind of start expanding. And then you have to learn. You got to bring in a regional team and you got to solve these things and kind of figure out kind of all those problems. But yeah, there's an incredible amount of consolidation in, in the healthcare business. And that that stretches all the way down to like literally very few funeral homes, for example, are not corporate owned. There's a, there's a bunch of consolidation in funeral homes, dentistry, there's consolidations in pharmacies, right? So there's just been a ton of consolidation in healthcare. And so that's happening in assisted living and memory care. It happens a lot in skilled nursing in particular. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's a tremendous amount of that. But what makes this business really fascinating, it's true to some degree in storage, um, is that you can outcompete, like you can be David and be favored over Goliath. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like all the, you know, Brookdale is the largest senior housing provider in the country. And we were in a market where we nearly put one of those out of business and we, wow. we still may, I mean, there, there was a, um, you know, and we're just a little, and we're charging more money than them. Right. So just imagine, you know, a situation where you can like, imagine if you opened a grocery store next to a Walmart and they were scared of you. Right. Wow, yeah. Um, that's, it's very strange, but that can happen in assisted living because if your team's great and your concepts are great and your buildings are superior and, and so I actually think what will end up happening in that vein of consolidation, I kind of think our exit, if, you know, if we ever, if we ever get out of Sejo, what will probably end up happening and what we're kind of positioning ourselves to be is to be acquired, okay. not, not sold. So I think that what will happen is, is that um, our plan is to build a thousand beds in DFW uh, by 2030. So we'll have six or seven of our, of our campuses approximately because campuses can range anywhere from like 80 to 160 beds. Okay. Um, if we do that and we're all kind of in this tight geographic area, we'll, we'll trade at a higher number. And I think what people will say is like, look, we, we see what you're doing. We don't really understand how it's working. I don't, we don't know how you're taking market share from these other places. We don't really get it. You know, there's just, they're, you're just building houses. We don't get it. And so, you know, big companies like that, they don't, they don't try to copy you. They just buy you. And so, you know, big companies just, you know, look, companies are always searching growth. And so they just always just come in and, and they overpay for things. And then they say, okay, we can bring in our software relationships. We have better cost of capital access. We can do X, Y, and Z. And, oh, by the way, Lo, do you want to stay on as CEO for a two-year non-compete or, or whatever, right? So that's probably what the exit is going to look like in this business. Because the truth is, is that, you know, it's really, it's a business of people, right? And so retaining the talent and keeping those people in place is, is really important when you acquire something. It's not really the physical building. It's not really the residence, although those are really important. When you do the underwriting, it's really like we want to keep the team intact because they understand the concepts that you're trying to do. Awesome. Love to hear that. And, you know, you know, having that position to be able to be acquired by something like that, it's huge, right? You guys really built something special. And I think that's uh, something that should be noticed. So, you know, we're, we're moving into 2023. What's the short term stuff that's happening for you guys? Where are you guys going? What's that strategy look like? What are you guys focusing on? Yeah, so we're just um, we're just stabilizing a couple assets now. So we had one um, one our, our crown jewel open in Denton in August, um, and so um, I guess this, I don't know when the show is going to air, but as of now it's December, right? So um, so we've been open for a few months. So we should probably be stabilizing, um, you know, Denton sometime probably Q three Q four of 2023, um, and then our Lake Charles community we hope um, might stabilize in Q two or Q three. Um, they're supposed to be a little bit further apart, but through a series of events, it didn't really work out that way. Like Charles obviously had a, a big problem with hurricanes. And so there was a lot of occupancy loss in that market because of the vulnerable population when they left for the storms, mm. a lot of them didn't return, right? So they stayed in various places on the coast and things like that. So 
Um, you know, we've managed to kind of battle through kind of a difficult occupancy market because when we designed the project, the market was at 96% occupancy. Now it's at 60, right? That's not exactly an ideal market to be invested in. We're very bullish on the market, but um, just, you know, you can't have, you know, four federally declared natural disasters in a year and expect to not have some challenges or problems, right? It's a record. Right. Um, so, um, you know, we'll stabilize those and then um, and then I'll take a break um, and then we'll come back and We'll start doing our zip code analysis uh, on DFW. We have some software we can go in and, and look at the zip codes. And, and we really like secondary tertiary markets, mostly because mm. we, we need land. And um, so we don't build vertic- uh, We don't build vertically, we build horizontally. So usually we have no stairs, no elevators, all single story. And so we are kind of land intensive. Um, and so uh, we're kind of, you know, kind of low density land intensive. And so we try to, um, we try to uh, essentially, you know, find six to 10 acres in a secondary or tertiary market where we think there's a supply demand imbalance. And, you know, so we like doing ring cities and DFW, things like that. And so the advantage that kind of gives us too, is like no one in a boardroom in New York, on um, some publicly traded company is like, Hey, like where, what's going on in Midlothian, Texas? Like no one's saying that. Right. And so um, as an example, right. So that's not on our list or anything, but I'm just giving right, an example. Right. So that's what happened. That's was our experience in Denton is that Denton is this incredibly fast growing town it's actually, I think at one point it was the fastest growing county in Texas, um, wow. a couple of fortune 500 companies there and it's 45 minutes from Dallas proper. So, you know, like it's still Dallas to, right you there. know, it's still Dallas to the outside world, but it's a secondary market and it's its own standalone market. And so a lot of people aren't investing. And so you're seeing cranes everywhere in Dallas, right? Overbuilt, right? Challenges because everyone's competing for that. It's like, we'll just move like 45 minutes down the road. And then <laughs> you can often get similar rents, cheaper land. Um, there's sometimes better labor access in those, those environments. And so we're really big on that. So we'll, I'll take a little break and, and then, uh, you know, I'll come back a little bit of a, a little bit of a sunburn or suntan, depending on things go down. And then uh, we'll, uh, we'll get off to thousand beds and DFW by 2030. Awesome, man. I absolutely love to hear it. We're going to be, uh, you know, following you guys for sure. One thing before we get out of here though, Lo, uh, you know, I talked to a lot of passive investors. I'm a passive investor myself. And, you know, we hear a lot about, you know, the demographic shift, baby boomers, all that stuff. Right. And I know that's not, might not necessarily apply to, um, assisted living and memory care right now, but, you know, we have, I have a lot of, uh, passive investors talking about, they would like to get, you know, they participate uh, in this in this area, right? They're 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 in multifamily, they're in self storage and mobile home parks, but they've yet to dive into this. What are some good ways to for them to to learn more, um, you know, about about the product, about what you're doing, and uh, really just learn how to evaluate these types of opportunities? Yeah, so I mean, I guess you know they're welcome to contact us and and, and get on our list. Um, you know, obviously you got to bet the operator. That really is the key. So I would say a big chunk of our investors. Um, have physically visited properties, right? Um, partners that we've worked with have physically visited our properties. So, you know, we love to do that and love to show people around. Um, so they can visit um, goodhorncapital.com and uh, we have a copy of our book we can give away. They just put in their name and email address. They can sign up for our investor list. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that they're, uh, you know, get future offerings. Um, you know, obviously I think we connected because I kind of made fun of the concept that, this whole baby boomer thing, right? So the average age in assisted living is 87 um, in America and the oldest baby boomer is 74, 75. And so they really haven't started interacting with the product yet. They absolutely are interacting with independent living, right? And, and yeah, there are some 70 year olds um, and our new communities strangely skew younger. So when you build something brand new, people move in sooner. So, huh. you, you know, we might, we, we're kind of seeing maybe like 80 is kind of our average age in our Lake Charles and, and our Denton community. But um you know, the way to look at it is, is that here's what I really think. I, I think you kind of want to be in this game early because if you can figure out how to do this business well and and solve some of these problems before the demographic wave hits, then by the time everyone else that's jumping into this business in 10 years when it's quote unquote easy and the supply demands in their favor, I'm a 15 year seasoned operator, have seen multiple cycles, have been through a pandemic, all those things. And then these, this dumb money is like comes pouring in to try to like, well, I'm going to do this because it's really easy. And you're just going to get your clock clean because there's just, there's just so many problems and so many things that people don't know about. And so what we want to do is we want to be in a position to where when that money comes pouring in that we're primed for acquisition, right? And then, or we can not sell or not, not be acquired and just, you know, pick a new market. Right. So, um, you know, if we were to just, we could literally 
do Dallas and do Austin, right? And then, you know, maybe look at maybe San Antonio or sure. whatever, something like that. So we could just stay in Texas, deal with one state, you know, and have cachet and individual markets. And if you have a thousand beds in DFW, you're, you're one of the largest senior housing providers in a major city. Nobody in Kansas City knows who you are, but who cares? Right. And so you've got, and you have scaling and, you know, what ends up happening is, is that, you know, your regional managers, you can attract great talent because you're like, hey, like, what if you were a regional manager and never got on a plane to Iowa? And they're like, sign me up, right? Because you don't have to get on and do, you know, go to some far flung community, right? Nothing against Iowa. It's just most people would prefer to be home with their family and not on a plane to, you know, saying at the, the Phoenix Hilton Airport or whatever. So um, ultimately, um, shout out to the Phoenix Hilton Airport. So um, ultimately, what's what's kind of interesting is, is that you do that. But what you really get is, let's say that you have 20, like, let's say if you have six or seven campuses and you have like 21 key people, right? You have an executive director, a wellness director, um, and maybe one other, you know, you have an executive chef. Those are maybe your three key people on every campus. Well, if one of them gets pregnant and goes off on maternity leave or you have to terminate somebody or somebody quits or whatever the case may be, um, in, in the current model, you generally have to ask another person to do two people's jobs, right? Mm-hmm. And it's challenging, right? To do two jobs. But if you've got scale and you're tight geographically, you're really asking 20 people to do the job of 21 or you're asking gotcha. 19 people to do the job of 21. And so you can, you can, you can beg, borrow and, 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 and steal resources from each other. And you can really create a really, really powerful ecosystem. Um, you can attract obviously top talent, as I mentioned before, because of, you don't have to get on a plane. Um, you can always be home with your family. And, and, and so then now I get to the whole ultimate decision is, do we want a helicopter? Do we need a save <laughs> helicopter? Because ultimately, like, I don't want to be rush hour. You've got to fly over. Yeah, the, yeah. Right? I don't need a plane because nothing's very far away. So I need to land and then <laughs> helicopter in and there's no mountains here. So rest in peace, Kobe. We're just going to try to avoid go. that whole situation and just try to, it's very flat. It's not a lot of fog. So we're just going to try to look at that. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kidding, of course, but my, sure. my point in saying all that is, is that to me, that's the secret sauce. And, and I have friends that are, that are in like five or six different States and, and I, don't, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me because like, you got to learn five or six licensures and they're all different. Mm, and then I got you. your marketing efforts in Dallas don't help you, you know, in Houston and your marketing efforts in Maine don't help you in, right. in, in Miami. And, and, and so I just, I don't, I don't really get it, but if you can really just dominate an area, dominate a great market, then you can just replicate that in other markets if you want to, or you can, if it's no longer fun. You can just stop doing it. So that really is kind of our secret sauce to growth that we've really been really laser focused on. So I just turned down the whole, like, you know how hard it is when someone calls you and is like, do you want to open an assisted living facility in the British Virgin islands? And I'm like, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's really painful. <laughs> it's really painful, but like, yeah. you know, and I get that right. phone call, some version of it. Usually it's not quite as nice, you know, like Hawaii sure. is like, okay. Yeah. That sounds yeah. amazing. But sometimes it's like, there's not any great assisted living providers in some random city in Arkansas. I'm like, well, yeah. I hate to hear it, but uh, I'm, in, <laughs> yeah. I'm in DFW. So yeah, right. um, yeah, I know it really is painful. So yes, I have turned down a deal to go to the British Virgin Islands. And Sorry, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Love to hear. But hey, man, you know what? To your point, though, uh, backing up a little bit, you know, you're absolutely right. You want to be on the right, the right, the right. Uh, part of the wave of this, right? Uh, if you're, especially if you're an investor, right? You guys have already put in the lead work. By the time that dumb money shows up, which it absolutely will, right? You guys are going to be in prime position to to take all that and, you know, actually put it to use in a meaningful way and really help out a lot of people, right? So I think that uh, if, if anybody's listening to this and they're interested in learning more about this type of stuff, especially if, from an investor standpoint, reach out to Lowe. He's going to have all the good stuff for you. I know I'm definitely interested. So we're going to have to chat again for sure, but um, we're going sure. to make sure, to, we're going to make sure to put all your stuff on the show man so listeners can reach out contact you lo this has been great man i've learned a ton really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today yeah it was a pleasure thanks for having me hey real quick before we get out of here do me a huge favor and leave a rating and review for the podcast we're always looking to bring you guys the best insights and strategies for building our real estate portfolios and your ratings and reviews really help with getting top guest speakers that are the best in the real estate investing business i promise this will only take you a few seconds and i'd really appreciate it Thanks for being awesome, guys. Cheers.